Welcome back, everyone, to the Librarium of Ludus Infinium, where you can find RPG and RTS playthroughs, and many more playthroughs in between. And for fans or those new to 40k, I also do 40k lore. Let's see what adventure we have for you today during this Log oh, Hammer Weekend. So before I get into the video, I want to throw out a little bit of a thank you to Kibbs and the Bickering Bunch, including Fairman. I, uh, last night did a stream with them, and it was... In the times that I have actually played a game with another YouTuber in one of their streams... Yeah, it was the most fun I've had. So, just thank you to those guys. I have uh, their picture up right here. Go check out their channel. Show them some love. They're absolutely fucking awesome. Kibbs and... Kibbs is a very, very cool YouTuber. He's... Two of my favorites that I've been watching right now are Kibbs and Dev. Uh, or Short Fat Otaku. They're very... Um, not inclusive. Well, that's true too, but they interact a lot with their fan base, and that's really cool for me. They interact with their respective communities, and it, it's really awesome because it doesn't matter to them if they have, you know, one or a million people. They're always willing just to be like, hey guys, how's it going? And, and that's really kind of cool, and that's something that I think a lot of YouTubers have missed missed the mark or lost their way on. They've forgotten what it takes to be a YouTuber. Now, granted, I'm small, but I think the most important part of being a YouTuber is the community. Is making not making sure that you're doing everything you can to appease them, but at least making them feel welcome. You know, making them feel like they matter. Not just throwing them off to the side or, you know, doing what you want regardless of them. It's it's just something that I would like to say, you know, thanks guys for being awesome. So, into the lore. Today we're going to be talking about something that I've been complaining about in a couple of my videos. And I thought I would do not only a video with examples, but further explaining what I mean. So, going from the examples I've seen, one of the things that I think has been lost along the way, especially as you get further and further into the 41st and 42nd millenniums, is that the Astartes are written more as near robotic, they're just generic super soldiers, where in 30k, they're written... I don't want to say as people, because that gives off the wrong idea, but as people. <laughs> they're written as, as their own individualized characters, and it's so cool. So, with my first example from the Third Legion, the Emperor's Children, we have the captain of the Tenth Company, Saul Tarvitz. Now, I was going to put two people from the Third... Uh, Legion in here. I was going to put Saul Tarvitz and Lucius the Eternal because originally they were actually really good friends. And the cool thing about it is, is I like this example. It's in Horus Rising. It's in part two of it. It's split into three parts. The conflict revolving around 6319, the conflict revolving around murder, and the conflict around the Interrex. Well, on the planet Murder, they start off with the Emperor's children instead of the sons of or the uh, Luna Wolves. Whoops, almost let that slip. And they mention that Saul Tarvitz and Lucius show the bipolar nature of the Third Legion because Saul Tarvitz is grounded and he accepts his place as a line officer where Lucius is very driven. Not that Saul Tarvitz isn't. But he accepts where his place is, where Lucius wants to keep advancing and keep reaching perfection 
in men, it, well, he wants to keep reaching perfection in the sense of rank, where Saul Tarvitz wants to seek perfection in where he is right now. Now, as the books go on, one of the best interactions is going to be between Saul Tarvitz and my second guest, uh, Mr. Nathaniel Aguero, or well, technically a Battle Captain Nathaniel Garrow, because he's not a captain, because Death Guard, because Death Guard fucking suck when it comes to rank. Um, not as much as Emperor's Children, though. I will give them a little bit of credit. But the cooler interactions happen between Saul Tarvitz and Nathaniel Garrow, and between Saul Tarvitz and Lucius. Because with Saul Tarvitz and Lucius, you see that friendship... But you see that it is a bit of a one-sided friendship from Tarvitz to Lucius. And where Lucius does take it for granted and ends up falling to chaos where Saul Tarvitz doesn't. In fact, after Istvan three, nothing's really known. It's assumed that he died there, but it's never really um it's never really said. The the really cool part about it is, is they do have a one-on-one -on -one confrontation on Istvan. And he's like, he, he feels kind of heartbroken about the betrayal, but he knows that the extent from which they've turned from the Imperial truth, they need to be stopped, including Lucius. And it's really, really good how that's written. The other example is between Tarvitz and Nathaniel Garrow. And what's really nice about that is, is they were friends, I believe it's said, and I've read this a couple times, but it's not fresh in my memory, that they were friends either before their legions became the Death Guard and the Emperor's Children, back when they were still in the Great Crusade or at least early in the Great Crusade before they found their Primarchs, and they have etched into the forearms of their gauntlets an Imperial Aquila, and it shows their brotherhood regardless of legion. And in fact, if it weren't for Nathaniel Garrow, and if it weren't for the fact that Nathaniel Garrow remained loyal, Saul Tarvitz would have definitely died, because the only reason that Garrow believed him was because of that link. And that right there is really cool writing. It's a little cliched, given, but it's really cool because Garrow is going against his legion, he's going against his Primarch, he's going against basic logic. Because at the time, it was believed to be impossible that Astartes could fight other Astartes. And here's Saul Tarvis saying, like, no, they're going to kill everyone. And it's so absolutely, you can tell that it's having an effect on Garrow, even though he's a character on paper. And it's so well written and so cool, and I just do not see this. I do not get my my need for this in modern 40k that makes the Astartes cool. If I want to make any of the Astartes cool, I have to literally go to one of the destroyed legions, or to win the Traitor Legions, and make a homebrew, because, quite frankly, I mean, I can't do it with the Ultramarines, because they have a stick shoved so far up the ass, the only people they can compete with are another Loyalist uh, Legion, which would be the Imperial Fists. And they just don't do that. There's, like, one instance I've read in the first six books where... Other than anger, the on, the only time that Rogel Dawn has showed any kind of emotion, he made a slight smile, and it was a, from a joke he made, and it was a it was a little bit of a dry. It was a funny joke, and it was a little dry. But it, all he reacted to it was a slight smile, not laughing. Where um, he was with oh. Um, to Imperial Fist, and I can't remember the name of the Imperial Fist, but he was with the Mornival, which is Ezekiel Abaddon, Tarek Torgadon, Horus Aximand, and Garvia Loken, and they were all laughing, and he just kind of, eh. I said it, and it was slightly funny, he said, meh. It, so, I mean, it's just, there's something missing there for me. There really is, and it. I found it 
with the 30k Astartes. And now we're on to Gera. I love Gera. I, I, I will freely admit I did not like him at first. I thought he was just a clone of Logan and that they had the same personalities. And in the third book, Galaxy of Flames, it's kind of shown that he is. He's fighting against his Legion and against Belief, like Logan is. But when you get into the fourth book, Flight of the Eisenstein, where it focuses on Garo, oh man, he is such a different character, and it's so cool. I mean, they have very, very deep similarities. But at the same time, they are so different in so many other aspects and it's so beautiful to see it's so well written oh my god i love it oh that makes me so happy um <laughs> now that i've gotten that out of the way so one thing that i think is funny he's from the 14th legion the death guard he's the battle captain of the seventh grade company and because the death guard is the death guard the first captain is Typhus, or Typhon at the time. I can't remember the name of the captain of the second great company, but his title was Commander. And then three, four, five, and six were all called Captains, but two and seven are the only ones that are different. It's Commander and Battle Captain. And the reason is because 7 is a special number, and I don't know why 2 is, but 2 apparently is as well. <laughs> so, yeah. Death Guard, fucking thanks for that. Um, so the cool thing about Garo is, here's one of the things that makes him a lot different from Garvio Loken. He finds faith. He finds the God Emperor. So, <laughs> this is actually really cool for me because Astartes are basically bred to believe in the imperial truth and the secularism of it. And he just like, this faith looks good. I'm going to do this. And it's a little more complicated than that, but it's really fascinating. So, when the rest of the... Original Traitor Forces at Isfahan 3 turned traitor, being the Death Guard, World Eaters, Emperor's Children, and at that time, then, Sons of Horus. He led a ship of... Now, this isn't confirmed in the book. This is just something that I've found. I've looked it up. This is the number I'm given of 70 loyal Death Guard. I don't know if they mean 70 Astartes. I don't think so. I think that's a combination of Astartes and humans. The really cool part is Malkador the Sigilite finally meets up with Garo and puts him in charge of a group called the Knights Errant, who would go on to be the Grey Knights. Now here's the thing that I find really funny, and this is something I have a couple of issues with. Someone else that he put over, or he was going to put in the Knights Errant, was the uh, Captain Logan. And, and I'll get into that a little bit more when I do Logan's segment. But the hilarious part about it for me is, is that the special thing about the Grey Knights, unless I'm mistaken, unless I have read wrong, all of them are psychers. There's no evidence showing that Garo or Logan was a psyker. In fact, of the original nine, the only one that was a psyker was, a, was an ultramarine, if I remember right. Because they've got to ruin all the fun. But it's, it's kind of confusing in that sense. Maybe it's just something that changed over time, and I just haven't gotten to that part of the lore yet. But it's really kind of cool seeing how Garrow kind of transforms from, you know, there's a badass battle captain of the Death Guard to the leader of the Knights Errant. And this almost 
paragon of what would be, be what would become the imperial creed of the and god i hope i say this right lectitio divinitatis i don't think i did um he he becomes almost a paragon of it it's so interesting to see this transformation but it's really cool at the same time because he's pushing away like Loken is pushing away from just his legion Garrow is pushing away from secularism and his legion which is a little bit more fascinating for me and he he really at first he's a little hesitant about it and it shows but then spooky ugabuga god emperor magic bullshit happens and all the spheres are wiped away just like that. And it's... I don't like that part of it because it's like, Ooh, spooky magic, spooky magic, tell me I need to do this. Oh, no, 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 no. Okay, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. Wait a minute, spooky magic told me I need to do it, so I need to do it. I will do it. It's kind of... Relatively speaking, it's kind of similar to what happened to Magnus because Magnus got um tricked he got he really did get manipulated by the forces of chaos to do some of the shit he did and really this is almost like garrow being manipulated by this um faith and at this time it's um done by the saint euphrates Kila. and actually my video next week will I'm planning on doing on humans in 30k compared to 40k. And I actually have a few interesting comparisons. But, uh, so it, he gets like these almost prophetic visions involving Kila, who is possibly the first saint to the emperor. And he just, auto, he's like, spooky magic, not supposed to believe in spooky magic. Oh, spooky magic says, Believe in God Emperor? God Emperor is Daddy Emperor? I will do this. And it just kind of... I believe that part happens too quick. But at the same time, even still, it's still pretty well written. And on to the good boy, the goodest boy of them all, Garvio Logan. And I hate saying this, but he's probably my favorite. And I also feel that's a bit unfair. Because he has... Three of the six books I have, I got them through Humble Bundle. The first three books revolve around him. Well, they revolve around him and the Luna Wolves and Sons of Horus and how basically from 6319 to the Isfahan Three atrocity. And the fourth book is about Garrow. The fifth book is... Fulgrim's Descent into Madness, and then the sixth book is about the Dark Angels. So across all this, I have approximately, I would say, two to three books just on Loken, one and a half on Tarvitz, and one and a quarter, at best, on Gera. So it's kind of unfair because there's a lot more exposure for Loken. But he probably is my favorite. I do like his character the most. He is the captain of the 10th company. Gets made as the fourth member of the Mornaval with Ezekiel Abaddon, Tarek Torgadon, and Horace Axeman. I almost called him Ezekiel Axeman for a second. Woo! Silly, silly me! And... When it came down to it, he fought on the side of the Loyalist. He... So the difference between him and Garrow is Garrow found faith and fought for the Emperor in that sense. He fought for the God Emperor. Loken fought for what he saw was right. Helm and Tarek Torgadon both basically split the Mornival in half. It was him and Torgadon and Abaddon and Axaman. And they were loyal and traitor respectively. And it was really cool because they were fighting for what was right. They saw that something was happening wrong. And the funny thing is, is Loken knew 
he, he had him dead to fucking rights. He knew that the problem was Erebus, but did nothing about it. And, and he couldn't, realistically, even if he wanted to. So he, it kind of sucked, realistically, for him. He was trapped between a rock and a hard place. He didn't want to believe this was happening, but he saw it happening with his own eyes. So it was really, I would call it near traumatic. And I went on to read about some of the stuff that would happen after Istvan 3, and I wouldn't, actually, I'm going to change my last statement. It wasn't near traumatic. It was traumatic. Uh, Garrow comes back to Istvan 3 after it had been virus-bombed and incinerated to the point where it killed every person, every Istvanian on Istvan 3, and found... Um, "Quote unquote survivors who are actually plague ho uh, demon hosts of Nurgle, and they were complaining about a monster that was killing them. And the monster was a um, how do I word this where it's accurate? It was Garvio Loken, but it wasn't. Uh, he was driven insane and developed a split personality." And he called himself Cerberus. And eventually, Garrow brings him back to some semblance of sanity. And later on, um, Tarek Twicad and Obi-Wan Kenobi's him, you know, like, I, I will be more powerful if you strike me down. Now, you know, that bullshit. I haven't seen Star Wars in a long time. Don't care to anymore. But, um,. He comes up as Ghost Gadden, and, you know, Lo and finally completely snaps Loken back into sanity, which doesn't make a whole hell of a lot of sense to me, but go with it. So, the funny thing is, is Malkador the Sigilite and the Emperor himself meet up with the nine members who are supposed to create the Grey Knights. Loken, Garrow, and the other seven, who are not as important <laughs> to me, I'm not going to lie. And the funny thing is, is one of the uh, requirements is that they have to give up their name, and they have to give up their past life, and Loken is not willing to do that. He wants to fight against Horus, and he goes on to fight in the Siege of Terra, and it's left ambiguous what happens there. He uh, Before this, actually, him and some of the Knights Errant had infiltrated the Vengeful Spirit and confronted Horus. And Horus said, yes, rejoin me, my son. I'm not truly evil. The Emperor is, you know, the same bullshit lines. So, uh, and he refused. So it shows a remarkable strength of will. And I think that's part of what makes Loken and, to an extent, Garrow's character extremely, extremely important to me, is they have this huge strength of will. They don't just say. Like, for instance, Lucius. One of the reasons that's given in the book is he wants to continue to be a part of the Legion. He wants to keep continuing to raise in rank in the Legion. So he can't turn against his Legion if he wants to continue raising, rising in the ranks. And so he turns traitor kind of for that, but also because he felt like the only reason he was on the planet is because he was lumped in with Tarifus because they were friends. And he's just, for such an amazing fighter, incredibly weak-willed at that point. But you never really see that with Loken and Garrow, and to an extent, again, Tarvitz. You know, it, it's really kind of cool to see them fighting not only this physical war, but this mental and emotional war of having to fight against people they once called brother, to fight against their own Primarchs, who they saw almost as a father figure. It was really fascinating. With one exception on that last thing, and I just thought about it. Garrow did see Mortarian with respect as a Primarch, but he was one of the Dusk Raiders who was around from the Terran stock before Mortarian got his hands on the Legion. And I'm going to say this right now. I have two least favorite Primarchs. Mortarian, because he literally 
ripped his legion in half with the changes he brought after he became Primarch. There were very few barbarous Death Guard who remained loyal. At the same time, there were very, very few Terran Dusk Raiders who turned traitor. And my other one is Lehman Russ. And a lot of people make fun of me for this, but I do not like Lehman Russ. I do not like the way he is written. He is very cliche to me. And, oh my god, he sucks. I just don't like him. It doesn't help that my favorite Primarch of all is fucking Magnus the Red. But, that actually has nothing to do with it. Those are two entirely separate things. You know, I love the fight between Russ and Magnus. That's a really well-fought thing. It's really well written out, and I'm getting way off track here. But, back to what I was saying as far as Mortarian being garbage. As a Primarch, he was garbage. In fact, probably the only one worse than him was Angron. Uh, <laughs> not saying Angron's my other least favorite. He's not. But when it comes to respect of how they handled their legions, they were probably the two worst. And, I mean, a lot of issue I have with the modern 40k is it doesn't go back to that. Like, something cool they could do, and there is a video, and it's done by Arch Warhammer, like, what would happen if you used Traitor Gene C to create loyal space marines? And I like that video. And, but like everything 40k, there are things I agree with, things I disagree with. And one of the things I actually really agree with is using original Dusk Raider or Death Guard Gene Seed to make loyal um, loyal Astardes. And on that note, you have people like Garrow and the people who stayed from the Eisenstein. You had the countless Dusk Raiders on Istvan who, you know, got, who did, if they didn't die from being virus bombed, which is one of the few things that they couldn't resist, it was, you know, they actually did take fire from the Imperator class Titan, the Dies Irae. So, I don't care how fucking tough you are, if you're in a star days and there is the literal biggest fucking titan shooting at you, it doesn't matter how tough you are, you gonna die. Along with probably everyone in about a 20 to 50 foot radius from you. And it was... This fun was a really fascinating thing for me to read. I both loved and hated it, how it was written. But I understand the way it was written, and it was written very well for what it was trying to do. And I don't see this in a lot of newer 40k stuff. And it, explicitly right now, I'm going to talk specifically about games. I don't really read any of the more modern books. I want to get through the Horus Heresy series before I start moving into like Dark Imperium and stuff like that. But... Well, not Dark Imperium shit. I forgot what it was called now. But there was uh, one book that I just saw uh, just got released a few months ago, and I've been wanting to check it out. And it's 40k, and I can't remember what it is, and I feel horrible for it. But it, like, let's talk video games. You know, with the Dawn of War series, there are some cool characters. Gabriel Angelos, very one-dimensional hero character. You have, uh, actually, here's a good example, con almost contrary to my point. You have the uh, Warhammer 40k Space Marine game. Now, you could argue that that doesn't help me. That, that, that actually argues against me. And had I not seen another video done by Arch Warhammer, I would have absolutely agreed. Where he talks about the Codex of Star Days. Originally, the Codex Astartes was written as guidelines, not as, like, the Astartes version of the Bible. And it's taken that way now, and I think that has a lot to do with why Astartes are written that way, because they've all been effectively brainwashed by something they weren't supposed to be brainwashed by. And you see that in Space... you see that in 40k Space Marine. But the thing about it is, is the one person 
who throughout the entire thing is like, no, this is what it's supposed to be, is completely outweighed by the mindless drone piece of shit characters like, but the Codex Astartes doesn't say that. It says not to do that. It just gets really frustrating. On the other hand, you have... Death Watch, which has about as much character development as it, as completely, oh, what's the word, inflexive? It has the opposite amount of character development as it does bullets fired at a given time. There. I said it in not a smart way because I couldn't come up with a smart way to say it. You have Warhammer 40k Inquisitors. I like that game. I'm not going to lie. I like that game. But it is an Inquisitor. <laughs> you know what you're playing. And it's... The one Astartes character in it just sucks. I hate him. I want to shoot him at a fucking airlock without his helmet. I um, I really do. Because it's a bullshit chapter written... I'm going to actually say specifically for that game. Um... But you start getting into fantasy, and I mean, you start to have similar problems. Um, but that's neither here nor there, because it's not 40k, and 40k is what matters. <laughs> but let me... It's... I'm trying to think of other 40k games I've played, and I can't think of any, and I feel bad. But I think that really is it. I've played all three Dawn of Wars... One has no character development because it's not honestly supposed to. Uh, Dawn of War 2 has some question mark. Three has Gabriel Angelos, which is stereotyped hero character. Uh, Space Hulk Deathwing, yeah, yeah. Fucking 40k Space Marine, so yeah. Uh, oh, and then the game that I have like 30 minutes in. Warhammer 40k Mechanicus, X, XCOM 40k, pretty much. Another game that I truly, truly am not looking forward to playing. But, they don't have to be written this way. They can be written very well. It's just, they're not. And I think that really, I think there needs to be a movement where people say, hey, bring back good Astartes. And they're, they're just, not gonna. <laughs> I mean, cause in, and I'll prove it right now. With two, well, technically three words. Primaris Space Marines. It's the opposite of what we fucking need right now. Oh my god, I hate these things. Everything I've read about them makes me just, makes me want to have a fucking aneurysm. It's so bad. Call makes me want to have an aneurysm. His, like, this is another point. In books one through three, well, oh man, let me correct this. Books two and three, which are Galaxy in Flames and False Gods, is there shows some groups of the Mechanicus. And they are not written like fucking Call for a reason, because Call sucks. He fucking sucks. There are veins popping out of my neck. I'm bitching so much about this. But that being said, that Call sucks, I want to go back to getting things written the way they were then, because they were written well. I, I haven't really, and I've heard about this, you know, there are some that, like, write the Emperor is bad because they don't like the Emperor, they don't like the idea of the Emperor, what the fuck ever, don't care. Write it as it was intended to be. Leave your emotions, and not leave your emotions out of it, that's not the right thing to say. Leave, okay. Let's say person A's name is Bob, and Bob is writing a story for 40K. Leave Bob, who is real person in year 2020, out of fucking 40k in the year 41,000 and what the fuck ever. You know, leave Bob out of that. Bob doesn't belong in that universe. Bob belongs in reality. And it's cool that Bob can write fantasy that way, but Bob has 
the only influence Bob has on 40K is that he is creating the universe, but Bob does not need to write himself into the universe. And I think that's where a lot of the writing has lost its way. And it's a, a damn shame. It really is. And I'll say this. I have two really favorite writers. I, well, one, my original favorite writer was R.A. Salvatore of the Dark Elf series with Dritz to Erd. But I tell you, Dan Abnett, who wrote Horus Rising, I love his writing style. I really do. I think he wrote a couple of others in the books that I've read. I haven't really verified that. I think he wrote the first two, first three. I could be wrong. But his writing style in the first one, the way he writes Loken is beautiful. And I love it. And it's just so amazing. But <laughs> we just don't get that anymore. And I don't like it. It's... It's a shame, you know, and, and I have respect for authors. It's something I can't do. I'm not a creative individual. I did the artwork myself. That shows you the limits of my creativity. So I completely respect everyone who is more creative than me, which is pretty much everyone. But I... If I were to write something, or if I were to design a game, there's a difference between putting your heart and soul into it and putting you into it. And and that's something I think that gets muddled a bit. But after that long rant, because now I'm looking at the time like, mm -hmm, went a little bit too far off rails. I think I'm going to leave it there. I hope you all enjoy, and I hope you're all looking forward to the human comparison of 30K, 40K. And if there's any characters that you think are going to be there, let me know in the comments who you think is going to be on that list from either 30k or 40k and leave which one you think it is because my memory is horrible. Please help me out any way you can. <laughs> but again, I hope you all enjoyed and I will see you all in the next one.